composed of a lipid bilayer. Mm. Phospholipids make up a large part of the membrane and form yeah. a bilayer. The structure of the bilayer is due to the tail-to-tail -tail packing of the nonpolar hydrophobic tails composed of two fatty acid chains and the polar hydrophilic heads composed of glycerol and phosphorylated alcohol. The lipid bilayer is 5 to 10 nanometers thick and is embedded with proteins. Some cell membranes also contain cholesterol. A plasma membrane contains different types of proteins which are specific to the particular function of the cell. These proteins also enable the cell to interact with its environment. The entire structure of the plasma membrane can be described as a fluid mosaic model. The phospholipid bilayer has properties resembling fluids, and the differing proteins and their attachments on either side of the membrane resemble a mosaic. Cool. That was kind of cool showing how it moved. Anything else, honey? What's that just me? I enjoy that. The membrane resemble a mosaic. Okay, enough out of you. Oh, here it shows some uh, a, a protein letting stuff through. This is a different video. This the sodium a channel has receptor sites for a ligand acetylcholine. When the receptor sites are not occupied by acetylcholine, the sodium channel remains closed. When acetylcholine binds to its receptors, the channel opens. Therefore, the channel is called a ligand-gated ion channel. When the channel opens, sodium ions diffuse through and enter the cell. So that channel only opens when these things bind to it. Why do they? Why does it? Because they're the right shape. Okay? Is that, I mean, yeah. that kind of like how they know that it's a good thing? Yeah, like, they know They know when these things are around that those things are going to be around. But, like, but why is it with, like, why is it with those molecules? I don't know why they come together. Okay. That's a good question. But, but these things, these aren't seeking that out. They just happen to hit it. They just... That all molecules are moving, and so during the random floating around, they're going to hit. Is that protein just like mainly for in letting that stuff enter? This protein is just for letting sodium in. Okay. This is called a sodium channel. Let's see if there is any other. Oh, uh, what are these proteins called that water goes through? Do you remember? Aquaporins. 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 They have a name. And that's the best way for water to get in and out of the cell. Water can sometimes squeeze through the membrane, but very rarely. So could it be answer to number one of them proteins? What was question number one? Tell me about hydrophilic. No. I don't know. What's the... Which part is hydrophilic, which part is hydrophobic? The protein expands the whole membrane. It doesn't have a hydrophobic or hydrophilic end. For the, for the um, fingerprint question, mm -hmm. could it cell recognition proteins work as well? I mean, the glycolix works, but the cell recognition protein is also kind of like a fingerprint. Yeah. Right? I don't because think that was one of the choices. Yeah. It wasn't? So which one's hydrophilic? Hydrophilic is water loving, so it's, it's the, the ball, the, the head parts. There and there are hydrophilic, because they're near water. See, there's water inside the cell, and there's water outside the cell. So the hydrophilic ends are touching the water. The hydrophobic ends are away from the water. They're, they're the fatty acid tails right here. They fear water. They fear water, water fearing, hydrophobic. What's like in that whole free space? There? Nothing. No, just nothing. There's really not much space there. It's occupied by those by those little tails. But the drawing makes it look like there's a space, but really these tails are just hanging everywhere. Like spaghetti in there. I love spaghetti. <laughs> I like any kind of pasta. 
Oh, here's where they drop the dye in the fish bowl and it eventually turns purple. I saw that. Here's an example of diffusion. The plasma membrane is the gatekeeper of the cell, allowing certain substances in and out of the cell at certain times in certain amounts. Diffusion is a process in which substances move across a membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration, or between areas of opposite electrical charges. This is called the electrochemical gradient. Small, non-charged particles, primarily gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, can diffuse through the plasma membrane by moving in between the phospholipids in the bilayer. However, the cell needs to control what enters and leaves, and so transport proteins aid in the selective movement of other molecules across the membrane without the input of energy. Through facilitated diffusion, larger molecules, polar molecules, and charged ions use channel proteins embedded in the bilayer. The transport of other substances requires a special carrier that will bind the substance on one side of the membrane, which triggers a conformation change in the protein carrier, causing it to release the substance on the other side. I notice a lot of kids will tune out when I turn a video on, and that's very, it's very important that you don't do that. These videos have important stuff that I don't talk about, and I'll, it can't really be shown without the video because I can't show you the way these things move. Should we know the difference between isotonic and hypotonic and hypotonic? Yes, we do. Well, I'm doing that now. Other questions about this stuff? Why doesn't stuff come through the like, little metal bag that holds stuff? Yes, vesicles can take in large amounts of stuff at one time. This is how small amounts of stuff get through. We call that bulk transport when a vesicle is taking something in. And that's a huge area of the membrane it's kind of surrounding something real big and taking. Okay, so I want to get to what, how, I didn't really quite get to this yesterday, and I wanted to, to how water moves into and out of a cell. This is an interesting uh, situation here. This special, this glass tube here is called a thistle tube. And you can do this experiment in the lab. It's not that interesting, um, so I don't do it. But here we have a thistle tube full of a 10% sugar solution. If it's 10% sugar, it's 90% water. So that's 10% what we call solute. And here's a beaker that has 5% solute or 95% water. Are y'all following this here? Jordan, are you with me? Yeah? Okay, good. Yeah, that's fine. This, uh, there's, a, there's a membrane over the bottom of the thistle tube here. And that membrane will let water through. But it won't let solute through. It won't let the larger particles through. And they get what a thistle tube was. This, uh, this glass tube right here is called a thistle tube. It's a glass tube that's open on one end. It's got a big open side that looks like a mouth. And that mouth has been covered up by a membrane. So here's the membrane here. So what's going to happen in this experiment? Any idea? It's going to move to the lower concentration. It shows it on the side here. Water is going to go from high concentration in here to low concentration up here. Because this is 90% water and this is 95% water. So water will go down its concentration gradient into the thistle tube through the membrane. And you'll see the level of the water rise in the thistle tube. See how much higher it is here than over here? And it would actually come spilling out the top if you let that continue. Well, it's just like a fountain. So that would make the water like a fountain? On the outside, more solute? It would. It would after the water moved up. That's correct. It would raise the solute percentage. Good thinking. So is that like an example of a hypo? 
hypotonic. Yeah, we're going to get to those words in just a second. Hypotonic and hypertonic. Who asked that? No, that was a male's voice. No. That, was, that, was, that was me. Okay. No, I asked Thank that you. like yeah, five minutes ago. Yeah, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. <laughs> This shows a barrier. Those are sugar molecules, and the little molecules are water molecules. And that's a semi-permeable barrier. This membrane separates pure water on the left from the solution of sucrose and water on the right. OK, so I'm going to stop it right here. There's, there's pure water over here, 100% water. Over here, there's sugar water. So it's less than 100%. It might be 90% water. What's water going to do in this situation? Diffuse. You need, to, you need to understand this. Water wants to move from high concentration to low concentration. So there is what we call a, a concentration gradient moving this way. That means the water will spread and move in over here. The sugar, the sucrose, is in high concentration on the right, and it's in low concentration on the left. So the sucrose would like to move that way across the membrane. But it can't do it because the holes aren't, aren't big enough in the membrane. We have a lab where we do this kind of stuff with membranes and sugar water and stuff. We have a three-day lab coming up starting at the end of this week where we're going to be in the lab working with chemicals and moving them across membranes. Aren't you excited about that? Super. Yeah. The membrane is semi-permeable. Water can cross it, but sucrose is too large for the membrane's pores. Water molecules will move from a solution with a lower concentration of solutes to one with a higher concentration of solutes. A solution with fewer solutes has more water molecules that are... Oh, it cut off. I don't know why it cut off. I thought it was opposite. I thought it was high to low. It goes from high concentration to lower concentration. You just said no. No, he didn't. Come on, Stephanie. Really? Sucrose is too large for the membrane's pores. Water molecules will move from a solution with a lower concentration of solutes to one with a higher concentration of solutes. A lower concentration of solutes. That means a higher concentration of water. Does that make sense? So you were right. You, you did hear that right. That was this. It's a weird way to word it. Weird way to word. <laughs> That's what to say. Diffusion is the net movement of molecules down a concentration gradient. This is good. Watch this. This process allows small molecules, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, to cross the plasma membrane. Most polar molecules, such as sugars and proteins, cannot freely cross this lipid membrane. Although water molecules are polar, they are small enough to pass through the membrane freely. This special case of diffusion that involves the movement of water molecules across a membrane is called osmosis. If a molecule such as urea is added to one side of a membrane, it will not be able to diffuse across the membrane because it is both large and polar. Because of its polar nature, it will interact with other polar molecules such as the water. This interaction reduces the number of free water molecules on the right-hand side. With fewer free water molecules on the right-hand side, there is now a net movement of water molecules down their concentration gradient to the side with the urea molecules. Because more water molecules are moving into this area than are leaving, the water level on the right side will rise. If the osmotic concentrations of two solutions are equal, the solutions are isotonic. However, when the solutions have unequal osmotic concentrations, the solution with the higher concentration of solutes is hypertonic, and the solution with the lower concentration of solutes is hypotonic. Okay, lots of information in that video. If we have a solution, that has a lot of solute in it. Solute is the stuff that dissolves in the water. In this case, it's urea. It's weird that they chose that molecule. That's the, that's the waste molecule that's in your pee. The yellow stuff in pee. Anyway, they like that molecule, so here it is. Dissolved in the water. 
So this is pee over here. Somebody peed in the beaker. Um, anyway, uh, if it has solute, a lot of solute molecules in it, it's hypertonic. If it doesn't have as much solute molecules, it's hypotonic. These words are only used when comparing things. So if we're comparing one side to the other, that side's hypertonic, that side's hypotonic. They're words used in comparison. And here's how I keep them straight. If you have a lot of sugar in you, you're hyper. Right? That's how I keep them straight. So I remember, because they'll ask you these on test, is, is the solution that contains a lot of urea hypertonic or hypotonic? And you got to try to keep it straight. I always think if you got a lot of sugar in you, you're hyper. So if the solution has a lot of sugar in it, it would be hypertonic than compared to one that has less. I don't get that because hypertonic cells shrink. Okay, let's look at the next slide and I'll show you that, why that is. Hypertonic cells don't shrink, they grow. Is this hypertonic? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Is this hypertonic? Sure. No. Let's look at these cells. Let's go to the hypertonic one since you're, you're asking about that. Here's a cell that's placed in a hypertonic solution. That means surrounding this cell is is water that's very hypertonic. It's got a lot of dissolved substances in it, like really sugary water or really salty water. So if you place the cell in a hypertonic solution, then water's going to rush out of the cell and rush into the area that's hypertonic, the area that has a lot of solute. So it shrinks. So the cell shrinks when it's placed in a hypertonic solution. If the cell was hypertonic, water would be rushing into it. But the cell is not hypertonic here. The solution outside the cell is hypertonic. So water rushes out of the cell into the solution. Water will go always go toward the hypertonic area. Okay? Does that make sense now? Yes. How does the water know? Does it feel it or does it? It, it doesn't know. It's just like that uh, the one the video we just saw here. Naturally goes. It just naturally goes. Where was the freaking video we just saw? What is going on? It was one of those. Was it earlier? Camera things. Keep going. Keep going. There. It was here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it was. There. Okay. Thank you. Diffusion is the net movement of molecules down. A so let's not listen to this guy anymore. If we put some urea on one side. <laughs> It binds the water molecules. And that side is hypertonic. This side is hypertonic. And so these molecules, they're just naturally moving around. They're just going to spread out. And so you'll have them spreading to this side, you see. These molecules, they can't spread out because they're attached to the urea. So they'll stay over here. The urea can't go across the membrane because it's too big. So you'll have more water going this way than you have going that way. Make sense now? Yeah, just natural. This is so awesome. Y'all are so lucky to be in school here with me. I'm so great. I'm unbelievable. <coughs> so if you put a cell in a hypertonic solution, it'll shrink. A plant cell will shrink, and an animal cell will shrink. If you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, that's one that's mostly that's almost pure water. So we got pure water outside the cell. Water's going to rush into the cell now because the cell's hypertonic compared to the outside. And the cell will blow up with water. Plant cells can handle that because they have a tough cell wall around them that keeps them from exploding. But an animal cell will just explode. Boom. We call an animal cell exploding. We have a name for that. It's called lysis. So. Why lysis? Okay. Sorry. Uh, lys means death. It's a Greek word. So. Okay, so how there's like two sections, like the hypertonic and the hypotonic. Mm-hmm. So that the hypotonic is going to fill with water. Why? I don't understand why. 
Okay, this cell, this is just a cell, but it's in a hypotonic solution. Mm -hmm. So outside the cell is hypotonic. If outside the cell is hypotonic, that means it's got a lot of water. That means inside the cell is hypertonic. That means there's more sugars or dissolved substances inside the cell than outside the cell. Water always moves toward the hypertonic area, toward the area where there's more solute. Okay. So this cell, in a hypotonic solution, water's going to rush in. This cell is in a hypertonic solution. So it's in a solution that has already it has a lot of sugars and stuff in it. So water rushes out of this cell, and the cell shrinks up. You want me to get that? It's Miss Bias. Answer, answer. I'm not going to answer that. Yellow. Yeah. Okay. I can't. We, I've got a class right now. Tell them to come uh, right after this class. Okay. All right. Bye. Um. So, why isn't the uh, animal cell like the first? Didn't you say that the membrane like comes back together? This is such a huge burst, it won't be able to recover from that. If you make a small puncture, they'll fill back in the area. But if you make a huge burst, then how does it fill with too much water? Because water rushes in from every angle. Because this water, this cell is hypertonic to its environment, which is hypotonic. And the water will go in through the little aquaporins and such all around in the membrane. And, and all this water rushes in, and the cell can't handle it anymore, so it bursts. So how how would the cell be in that situation? Like, how would you? If you take a, a, an animal cell, and you put it in pure water, just drop it in, in a sink or something filled with water, water will rush into the cell, and it'll burst up. So how come when we jump into the water, or jump in water, we don't? Explode because you have a waterproof barrier all over your body that doesn't let any of the water in. Oh, which is this? Or you would explode. How does it happen like naturally? So without setting it in a bucket of water, how does it happen? Yeah, and how if you don't? If you have a well, uh, it can happen. Uh, there are cells that get in water, like a amoeba. If you drink water, does that happen inside of you? It does to some extent, but what happens is. You have salts and stuff in your blood that get in there and, and dilute it and make it not so like drinking water? I don't know. You can just throw up. Is that how you drown? No, the the drowning, drowning interferes with, water with the water. way you with the way you breathe and take in oxygen. No, that's not stupid. No, that's not stupid. It's just a different mechanism. I mean, how come it could? If you didn't have that problem, then you got too much water in you. It could dilute. Your, your body. And How I come if you get a cut, then we get the water we don't explode? It would, it's to some extent. If, if you got a cut and water got in there, some of those cells would die. Question. They burst. Yeah. Is that why people, does that like protective barrier go away? Like if someone dies and then they get thrown to a river or something and their body expands, is that because the cells would Yes, all of that, yes, yes. The cells would start expanding and fill with water and burst. If they they threw you in fresh water. They threw you in the ocean, it'd be the, the, the opposite. You just shrivel. You'd shrivel up, yeah. Uh -huh. so, if you're like, so if you're like, if <laughs> somebody and you've got like a plate off or something, and you dipped it in water, what would happen? Yeah, this, the water would move and the cells would start to expand. That wouldn't be good. Oh, so you would have a big finger, or what do they do? Like yeah, it would swell up, yeah. It's like a lot. Like if it sounds like it would be like a big is that why you Your body has ways of protecting itself against the outside, so... Yeah, but if you were dead, yeah, and they threw you in the, in the water, your cells would swell up, and you'd get real big. Does that have to do anything with your, like, fingers proof? No. That's all from the skin oils in your skin. Let me show you. This is a situation where a cell is in an isotonic environment. Isotonic means there's the same amount of solute inside and outside the cell. So there's no net movement of water. Some water comes in, some water goes out. It's about equal. So the cell doesn't expand or shrivel. Those other cells that shriveled or expanded, um, do those not have aquaporins? They do. All right, then why aren't they working? They are working. Then why are they bursting or 
Because, because again, there's more, in, in this case right here, let's just look at this one. There's more water outside the cell than there is inside the cell. Okay, but. Okay, that's, that's a hypotonic solution. So, wait, wait, let me explain. The water will go in through the aquaporins. And the cell will start expanding, and water's rushing in through the aquaporins, and the cell can't hold itself. The water's rushing in so fast, and the cell bursts. Don't the aquaporins help? Stabilize the. Not, not necessarily. If there's more water outside than there is inside, water. the water will keep rushing in. So, why don't they tell the cells to stop taking in? They're just holes. They, they don't have any way to tell anything. They're just holes. Aquaporins are just open. So, do you think eventually our cells will make it so they can control if water gets in or not? No, it works fine. They work fine the way they are. Because this usually doesn't happen inside your body. You have that protective skin barrier. So that's kind of like a kind of a rare thing to have. No, this happens all the time in nature and other instances. We'll do some in the lab where we do this. So if you took an ant, so things just explode. Or something. Yeah, cells, cells explode all the time. Cells but expand. It's not, cells but it's tremble. Not always fatal. It's not usually fatal, right? It doesn't always happen in humans. Yeah, if you took some sort of... Let's not try to apply everything to humans in life for a while until we've, we've learned all this, all the basics of it, okay? Let's, uh, but I, I mean, I don't mean to say stop asking questions, but we just, we got a lot to do here, so we got to move on. Okay. When the substance being moved across the membrane is water, the process is called osmosis. The cytoplasm of the cell, as well as the interstitial fluid, is composed of solutions. The solvent, usually water, moves across a semi-permeable membrane toward a higher solute concentration, consisting of various molecules or ions, until equilibrium of the solutions is reached. The plasma membrane contains proteins called aquaporins, which are specialized channels for the movement of water during osmosis. A cell in a hypertonic environment will have water moved from the inside of the cell toward the higher concentration of solutes in the solution outside the cell. In a hypotonic solution, the concentration of solutes is higher inside the cell than the outside environment, so water will diffuse into the cell. When the solutions on either side of the membrane reach equilibrium, they are referred to as isotonic. Okay? I really, I still don't understand osmosis. Osmosis just means the movement of water. So if you got more water down here than you have up there, water's going to move out. No, so it's just like everything. Osmosis is just movement of water. Okay. okay? So here I have a membrane. If there's a lot of water up there and not much down here, water's going to move in. If there's a lot of water down here and not much up there, water is going to move out. You see? And we just have words that mean having a lot of water. Hypotonic means has a lot of water, and hypertonic means doesn't have a lot of water. That was the opposite. No. No. Okay. Hypertonic means doesn't have a lot of water. It means it has a lot of sugar, has a lot of solute. If you're hyper, you have a lot of sugar and not much water. Hypo has more water. Hypo has more water. So if I took a cell and put it in a hypotonic solution, the cell would be in a lot of water. So water would rush into the cell, the cell would expand and eventually burst. Why would it rush into it if it was hypotonic? Why would it rush out? The solution that the cell is in is hypotonic. That means the solution that the cell is in has a lot of water in it and will rush into the cell, which doesn't have as much water. Does that make sense? Nice. Love answering questions, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, when we drink distilled water, does that come? That comes from reverse osmosis. Is that what they call it? Uh huh. So it's the opposite. It goes the other way from. They're removing the solutes from the water. Yeah, I see. Uh huh. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on and get to these carrier proteins. Mm -hmm. Page 94. Hey, and, and, and if, you, if you're still confused about hypertonic, hypotonic, I'm kind of moving on from that. Come after school and I'll try and explain it better. Okay? We're going to do a lab on it for three days. So we're going to keep hitting this hypertonic, hypotonic. So you'll have more chance to learn.
about, about this. Here is a carrier protein. A carrier protein kind of reaches out and grabs something and pulls it in. Sometimes it uses energy to do so, and sometimes it doesn't. And so here it shows some solute molecule. Maybe that's a piece of sugar or, or sodium or something. And it has a certain shape. And this protein is just looking for that shape. And it'll grab it and pull it in. And the protein actually kind of changes its configuration to pull this thing through. And it lets it on into the inside there. And I have video footage showing this. In the process known as facilitated diffusion, a special carrier protein with a central channel acts as a selective corridor which helps molecules move across the membrane. These special carrier molecules that form the protein channel bind only to a specific molecule, such as a particular sugar or amino acid. Once the molecule binds to the carrier protein, this protein helps or facilitates the diffusion process by changing shape and moving the molecule down its concentration gradient through the membrane into the cell where it is released. Facilitated diffusion is similar to simple diffusion in that both involve movement of molecules down their concentration gradient, and this movement is carried out without any input of energy. However, in facilitated diffusion, the movement of molecules will only take place if it is facilitated or helped by a special protein carrier in the membrane. All right, dude, that's enough out of you. So this, this protein helps move molecules in. You see how that's working there? It's helping pull them in. And it wouldn't be, those, those, those molecules wouldn't be able to get in if this protein wasn't there. And so we call it facilitated diffusion. Things are still moving from a high concentration to a low concentration, but this protein is facilitating. It's helping. It's helping it along. Can Facil stuff go out of that? Stuff could go out if the concentration gradient allowed. If there was a high concentration here and a low concentration there, stuff might go the opposite direction. No energy. It's, it's just Facilitated diffusion does not use energy. However, question? No? If you want to move something across the membrane in the opposite direction that it wants to go, that's going to require energy. And that's called active transport. Why would you really do that? Well, for instance, a cell might need food. And food might be scarce in the environment, glucose, let's say. And so the cell wants to keep food in, but if it sees more food out there, it also wants to pull that in too. So it would be pulling it in against its concentration gradient. Normally, the food would want to be going out, but the cell is trying to even pull more in. So it needs to keep the stuff that it has in and even pull more. It would be like if I'm a ping pong ball hoarder. You ever seen the show Hoarders? Imagine a ping pong ball hoarder. He's got a room full of ping pong balls filled to the top, and he wades through his ping pong balls, and he looks out the door, and there's a ping pong ball sitting on the floor. Well, he wants to get that too, right? But if he opens the door, all the ping pong balls are going to go out. That's the normal method of diffusion, from high concentration in the room full of ping pong balls to low concentration out the door. So you know what he's going to do? He's going to use energy to get that ping pong ball. He's going to do like this. He's going to hold all these ping pong balls in. And he's going to shovel that one in too. And then close. Ooh, it took a lot of energy. Even the lights came on. <laughs> That's active transport. We actively move it against its concentration gradient. And so that's what it's showing here. This is a special kind of active transport called the sodium-potassium pump that we'll learn about way later in second semester. But this shows... The sodium-potassium pump is an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions bind to the protein channel, and an ATP provides the energy to change the shape of the channel that in turn drives the ions through the channel. One phosphate... Okay, we don't have time to listen to this guy. 
But you can see sodiums come up and are released, and potassiums come in and are released. It's just a protein that kind of switches places with things. So like, does it need sodium, but it needs potassium? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And so, this kind of movement requires energy, and we call it active transport. Now, the last part of the, of the reading talks about bulk transport. It talks about exocytosis and endocytosis, which we've already seen, which is good. Exocytosis is a bubble, a vesicle, releasing stuff to the outside. And endocytosis is taking in a vesicle and pulling it in. And we've already seen this. Here's taking in a vesicle and pulling something inside. I already showed it to you uh, last chapter. Um, but here we can see something being taken in, watched by the cell. It pulls this thing in, you see? It pulls it in. I can go slowly enough. There you go. Or it pulls in, look at this, pulls in a lot of little particles. Pulling in something large is called phagocytosis. And pulling in small particles like these is called pinocytosis. Phago and pinocytosis. See, I'm not kidding. Phago and pinocytosis. Huh? And that sounds kind of dirty, doesn't it? <laughs> Unbelievable, all these. They kind of changed the name to phagocytosis and pinocytosis, so they wouldn't have to say phago and pino. But these are methods of bulk transport. That's what you were asking about earlier, um, Hannah. Then Hannah, I almost called you Haley. Sorry, does that happen a lot to you? Um, but anyway. Uh, The book talks about those some. Are we not learning 5.4? 5.4 is not on the test. We don't have to do that. Just knock off 5.4.